Good morning. Uh, welcome each and every one of you to the church this morning. We have a couple of announcements we need to share very quickly. Number one, uh, just to remind you that next Sunday morning at 9.30 will be our congregational prayer service. We will meet in the latest parlor. So be aware of that. Uh, I know it's a whole week now. You've got to remember this. I won't see you again before, hope, well, some of you I might, but not most, most of you. I won't see you again before next Sunday morning. So be aware of that. Make a note, mental, physical, whatever you have to do to remind yourself that we will have our congregational prayer service next Sunday at 9.30. Lois, did you hear that? Lois Rose. <laughs> Lois, did you hear that? Next Sunday morning, next Sunday we're having that congregational prayer service. <laughs> All right. Moving along this afternoon at 2 o'clock. I'm asking all the priesthood, and that's all priesthood, to be here at the church. Um, we have some items that we need to talk about. I promise you I will not keep you any longer than just absolutely necessary. So if you will, please uh, be in attendance here this afternoon at 2 o'clock for a priesthood meeting. And we have our peace copy that we've announced. You see it in your program. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Larry Steiner if he will come forward and share with you some information about that. You know, I always tell you to do this. I'm going to do it again. If you would turn to the announcement regarding the peace colloquy. Have you found it? and just follow along as I read Peace Colloquy Sunday, November the 2nd at 4 o'clock p.m. We proudly announce that the recipient of the 2014 Peace Award is Carrie Keller. Carrie was president of Cottage Hill Little League at Mims Park for more than 25 years. If any of you who have been a part of ballparks, you know what that means. Amazing. He's an awesome, awesome individual. Mark your calendar and plan to help. We're expecting a large attendance and details will follow. And let me just emphasize that uh, we are expecting lots of people and we will need lots of help from you. So uh, just Stay tuned for, for further details, and we have uh, five weeks. If you will, um, in continuing, uh, just to call your attention, be sure that you check your uh, cleanup schedule to see those that are, um, that are there and that they are what day that you, week that we've got you assigned to clean up, the, no, we're not asking you to clean the entire rock here, but to clean the foyer and the bathrooms and just straighten up and make this area look presentable if as much as possible. So just be aware of that. And I believe that pretty much gets my announcements and I want to apologize. Uh, last Sunday I just got so caught up in LSU and Mississippi State and all those things that I we I just kind of let the birthdays kind of get by me and Gene reminded me so I really uh, sincerely I think birthdays are an important thing for us to recognize and so I'm going to go back a little little bit and we're just going to share with you some names here some people that I know had birthdays in the last week or two or whatever here uh, we know that Sonny Golf had one last week, and Monica had one, uh, David's wife. But also, I, I noticed as I looked through the uh, directory and checking out de names and birthdays, Susan Dees had one on the 27th. Um, Matthew uh, Griffin had one on the 24th this past week. Um, Julia uh, Joseph, or Mark Joseph, and Eric's and, uh, daughter, and, Mar and Eric and Barbara's granddaughter, 
had one this past week. Uh, Jackie Martin had one also. Um, Sarah Elizabeth Mooney had one uh, just, uh, I think, day before yesterday. Wade Williams has one, I think, tomorrow. And Jennifer Carlisle, uh, Virginia's daughter, she has one this coming week. And the most important of all I have to uh, in my family is that Marty has one coming up Wednesday. So those are the individuals that I saw that are having special days this last week or so and then this coming week. So if you'll join me, we'd like to sing happy birthday to all those good people here this morning. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. I got just a minute, and I do want to just share one thing with you here. Uh, I have been, it's shared with me that some of us are um, concerned about where we're at with the restoration. Uh, not the restoration of the gospel, but the restoration of the church, uh, the church building here. Um, let me just tell you that there has, has a couple few rumors, I'm sure, that's floating around about different things. Um, the statement was made to me that some of, uh, some of our people think that me and Stancil are deciding everything, and I'm here to assure you that is not the case. There will be nothing done without you knowing about it. There will be no major decisions made about the church building and what, how we will change it or whatever without you knowing about it. And I appreciate the trust that you put in us to, to handle this, uh, but I promise you that we will probably, very in the very near future here, have a get-together at some point. We probably won't do it on Sunday because Sunday is so packed with that. We're going to probably do it some, at some other time. But when we have some real concrete information to give you, I'm going to have a meeting and have everybody that wants to attend can attend. You can ask as many questions as you want to ask, and we will give you as much information as we have available to us. And so appreciate your prayers and your patience, and let's continue to do what we're doing, and that's worship and enjoy being together. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sheila. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our service. Uh, I appreciate everybody's involvement that are up here on the rostrum and, and Sheila's preparation for the music. Um, and uh, uh, John told me that he was going to deliver a really uplifting sermon this morning that everyone's going to leave here a changed person. So um, I think it's going to be a very good service. The, uh, I got a little, a little announcement here. Um, there's an addition to your uh, order of worship. After uh, the offertory, we're going to have a hymn. It didn't make it in the, uh, in the uh, bulletin. It's hymn number 69, We Limit Not the Truth of God. And I will get up and remind you all at that point as well. Our call to worship comes from uh, Philippians, um, <clears throat> Paul's letter to the Philippians. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being present with our brothers and sisters this morning, being in this place where we have experienced the blessing of your Holy Spirit a number of times. We thank you for the strength and the blessing that it has been to each of us. And we come this morning with a, a, uh, a list, each of us, a list of concerns and reasons to be thankful somehow unable to express our thankfulness in meaningful ways to you for your presence in our lives and your blessings upon us. But indeed we do, and we trust that you know our deepest feelings. We also know, Heavenly Father, that 
you know our deepest needs. And we pray that this service this morning might be a source of, of addressing those needs, those concerns, those fears. And bless us, Heavenly Father, that we might be a strong people in our faith and able to reflect that strength and that faith into the eyes and hearts and minds of others who are so desperately in need of the presence of your Spirit in their life. Bless us as we continue, dear Lord, and especially with John, as he brings us your message, those things that he has prepared and those things in which you will enlighten his mind as the progress of this service continues. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Part of our witness as disciples is sharing the news of God's great generosity. All that we have and all that we are is a priceless gift to us from God. What then is our response as disciples of Jesus Christ? In simple terms, we respond with thankfulness and share with others as generously as God has shared with us. In 1 Peter 4:10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as, God, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Scripture guides us in our discipleship. Doctrine and Covenants 147, 5a tells us that stewardship is the response of my people to the ministry of my son and is required alike of all those who seek to build the kingdom. All things were created by God and are to be used for God's purposes. As disciples of Christ, we explore the scriptures to understand our stewardship of time, giftedness, and financial resources in response to God's grace and love express, expressed to us in the life of Jesus Christ. Will the ushers come forward? Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you are the owner and we are the managers of what you entrust to us. Help us to live for you each day and to generously share the time, talents, treasures, and things you have given us. Amen. Uh, hymn number 69.
morning. Yeah, most people have a glass of water when they're up here, but uh, thanks to Mary, I have a box of tissue. So <laughs> I have been fighting some kind of allergies for about three weeks now, so I, I sneeze and snort here. Um, I don't know, most of you probably know my brother Mike. I, I brought my brother with me this morning to, to keep me honest. And uh, he and uh, my sister-in-law are about to uh, go on a new adventure. They're, they're going out to Jacksonville um, to be a live-in nannies, full-time grandparents uh, with Karen's uh, newborn, Cameron. And uh, so it's going to be a new experience, a new adventure. Five people, two cats, all in one household for two or three months here. So uh, they may want to keep our theme in mind. Uh, our theme this morning, and uh, that is be of one mind and one heart. In the event, and I, I, I did prepare this. In the event that I were to miss my target this morning and you were to end up at the end of the hour wondering, you know, what was the point, I do want you to uh, know that there is a fallback plan. There is the scripture that uh, these words are lifted from, and that is as uh, the scripture that Tim read at the beginning as call to worship, and that is from Philippians. This is uh, Paul's letter to the saints at Philippi. Uh, second chapter and so if all else fails uh, if you go home and read this it really is a very uh, personal uh, heartfelt uh, letter that Paul is writing to, to his loved ones his, his uh, friends and, and loved ones in Philippi and, uh, and it really is a, a sermon in itself but uh, let me begin. I, I, I did want to take just a quick survey, and this is really not anything that you have to answer out loud, but this is just within your own heart, your own mind. How would you classify yourself? Are you, do you see yourself as an optimist or a pessimist? Do you see the half glass of water as half full or half empty? And I found this quote, and this was from Abraham Lincoln, which kind of put a little bit different spin on it. And he said, uh, do you lament that the rose bush has thorns, or do you rejoice that the thorn bush has roses? And I wasn't sure that I was going to get that out right, but, but yeah, that was it. I think generally I would consider myself optimist. I, I generally have always been pretty optimistic. Uh, I don't know that I can really take credit as anything or effort on my part. I, I think it probably came from uh, parents that uh, early on convinced me that uh, things were always going to work out for whatever was best. And uh, I can't say that I was always successful in my endeavors. I, uh, in junior high school, I tried band, and music was definitely not my strong suit. I definitely have a tenure. I cannot tell one note from the other. Uh, tried football in high school. I think we won two games out of two seasons, so that was, tells you something there. But generally, um, you know, things have, have always tended to to work for me. Things have always, uh, sometimes it just seemed like I was at the right place at the right time. Uh, I graduated from college wondering what in the world was I going to do? No idea of a career. But a friend of mine had uh, graduated a year earlier and he was teaching school up at a little school in North Mobile County. Some of you may have heard of it, Calcedeva. At that time it was a grade grades 1 through 12 and uh, my friend happened to mention to the principal there that uh, that I was graduated and, and 
looking for some kind of employment. Uh, and some of you may have known the principal, uh, Fred Barlow. Any of you remember Fred? Well, Fred, uh, he was principal there at that time, and he uh, had a vacancy, he had an opening. School had already started, but he had an opening. And so uh, he called me and asked me if I would be interested in taking that, taking that position. It was teaching in the high school, which was maybe 50, 60 students in the whole high school. And uh, I said, sure, <laughs> I didn't have anything else. And you know, it turned into a 33-year affair. Uh, if you count the years that I went through school, another 12, I, I, I've had a 45-year affair with the Mobile County Public School System. And even now, I still am associated with it. And I really am uh, a believer in the, in the adage that says that if you uh, enjoy your work, you never have a job. And I really, I always enjoyed whatever I was doing. I had a lot of different opportunities, a lot of different uh, responsibilities, but I, I always enjoyed everything that I did. And so I really felt like uh, I really did not, did not have a job. But you know, I'm a realist enough to know that uh, not everybody, not everybody has everything to be optimistic about. There are some people, and there are many, who have real challenges and real obstacles in their life. And there are, as we know, I mean, you only have to read the newspapers to know that, that there are entire populations of people who, for no choice or no fault of their own, are born into situations of extreme poverty, uh, extreme violence. Uh, and you have uh, those that are living in, in conditions of, of uh, daily epidemics. You can only listen to radio or TV and know that in West Africa, the, the epidemic Ebola that's just almost shut down some of the, the countries that are there. So we know that, that there are uh, great divisions. There is probably a real gulf between those that have and those that have not. And then that also divides down many times between differences of ideologies, differences in theology or religion, divisions along the lines of race and ethnicity, you know, all over the world. And so it brings me to, and these words are not mine, but these are words taken from the worship resource that was provided to us. And it says that today, people continue in, to face strife and struggle and often respond in unhealthy ways. Many people look for saviors who will divert pain away from themselves and onto another group or community through warfare, economics, or political power. Spending precious time to accommodate people with different perspectives and understandings often seems unproductive and unnecessary. Issues or concerns outside areas of personal interest seem irrelevant. Being involved in fast-paced, continuously changing, results-oriented, de detached, individualistic living causes many people to understand that healthy community life as a quaint and charming concept, concept but a non-reality. With this mindset, the only God worth worshiping is one who gets individuals, individuals what they want 
when they want it. That then brings us to our theme and our scripture for this morning. I mean, it, it really is a challenging theme when you think about it. Be of one mind and one heart. These words are lifted from the scripture from Paul's letter to the saints at Philippi. And you may have remembered that last Sunday, George also spoke from this same uh, letter. He spoke with, from the first chapter of the letter, uh, dealing with live the gospel. And these words, today's theme, is lifted from the second chapter. And if you remember from George's remarks last week, Paul at this time was in prison in Rome. It was somewhere during the first half or of the first century, somewhere between 50, 60 AD. Uh, it seems that the that the the followers in Philippi had a strong affection for Paul. Paul had a strong affection for them. Uh, from what I understand, Philippi was probably a Roman colony, maybe 600 miles from Rome at that time. But it was, oh, well, it was, it was located, you know, somewhere between, borderline between Greece and Turkey. But it was one of the first uh, groups of people that, uh, that Paul administered to in what today would be called modern Europe. And uh, the saints there had, uh, had such an affection for Paul that they had sent uh, an emissary and uh, this man's name was, and I'm going to try to get it right, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus. And they sent him with money. They sent him on this 600 mile trek to Paul in Rome, prison in Rome to to support him, to give him some kind of assistance. And uh, it was a pretty arduous trip. And when he made it there, he was, from what they understand, pretty poor health. He almost died, but recovered. And Paul had decided that maybe he ought to send him back uh, to Philippi. But he was taking the opportunity to, uh, to write a letter. He wanted to send a letter to his friends and uh, loved ones there, thanking them for their support, thanking them for their love, thanking them for their financial contributions to him. But in the meantime, he had uh, received word that uh, there was some kind of conflict, there was some kind of discord that was going on uh, among the, the saints there, or the members there. Some of it was from external, but I think the one that Paul was probably most concerned about was the, the conflict that was within the group there. And you know, it did not seem to be that it was a, uh, issues of a particularly uh, theological nature. I don't think that it was one of uh, doctrinal disagreements. It seemed to have been more of a, a personality conflicts, some kind of a, a question of status within the, the group, something in, you know, in terms of what was uh, the uh, traditional way of doing things. But at any rate, it was causing problems. It, it, it must have been threatening a meltdown in this, in this group there that Paul became concerned about. And so his letter at this point changed. It, it changed from just being one of thanking them for uh, their gifts. It was more to try to bring some kind of unity, some kind of uh, togetherness, uh, oneness uh, to, that, to that group. And so that was, that was the letter that he wrote. Now, you know, we may think at this time, you know, that that seemed kind of pity. The question of, of personality conflicts and, and status and traditional way of doing things. 
But you know, those kind of things have a way of taking on an emotional edge that, uh, in life of their own. I remember as a teenager, uh, where, we were, where I was going to church, we had a fairly new sanctuary there. And we had, uh, all the walls were painted this nice neutral beige color. And uh, except for one wall, one wall was painted, well, no, it was. It was a, a natural pine finish. I mean, it was uh, the wall that went behind the, uh, the pulpit. And it was um, not your, you know, not this four by eight sheets of ply paneling, plywood paneling you would get from Lowe's or Home Depot. I mean, it was real paneling. But there began to be some discussion that maybe, you know, maybe we ought to paint that so that it would match the color of the rest of the walls. And then becomes the pastor's nightmare that there arose almost an equal number saying, no way, you can't paint over that paneling. It's part of the original decor. It's part of the design. It adds to the, the, the appearance. So it became a really emotional issue that almost caused a meltdown. We uh, came to a business meeting. You know, what do you do? Take it to a vote. And it passed with uh, a very small margin to, to paint. And in, in an all sense of full disclosure, I, I was one that voted, voted to paint. Uh, my parents, on the other hand, they didn't vote to paint it. They, they did not want to see that covered up. So it, uh, it divided not only congregation, it divided families. And I, and I had my parents reminding me occasionally after that that it was probably my one single vote that resulted in that beautiful paneling getting covered with a coat of latex enamel beige paint. But anyway, it, it, it was. It became a very emotional issue that uh, threatened to, you know, to cause a, a, a divide, a gulf in that, in that community. I don't know that we lost any members over that. I, I, I can't remember that, but I just remember that it was such a, uh, an emotional issue. So then that brings us back. Here we are. Paul is in Rome. He is awaiting trial. He is uh, possible execution. Uh, and yet he is concerned. He's writing this letter to the, to the followers in Philippi, trying to bring that sense of unity and that oneness, and I guess bringing them back to what is the big picture. What is that we're all about? And then I'm going to, to read that entire section, section two, because like I said, it, it is the message in itself. But I would ask you that as I, that I read this, that you would uh, look for three themes that really Paul is carrying out through this letter. One, being that the call of discipleship is to imitate Christ, the humble servant. That two, as disciples respond by adopting Christ-like, self-giving love for all, they experience the very nature of God. And that when disciples take on the mind and the heart, there's a theme, of Christ, and live for the benefit of one another, life in community becomes divinely transformative. And this is Philippians 1 through 13, and this is in uh, what's called the New International Version because it's one that I can understand. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness 
and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider himself equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the time, Jesus, every name, at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good promise. Paul's letter to the Philippians was definitely meant to encourage them in a time of strife and struggle. It describes the nature of Christ, the presence of God, and him who was servant to all and who was willing to put his interest of humanity above his own. We continue in this day and age to remember that, that confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, we become representatives in the world. It may be difficult, it's not something that we can achieve total perfection but it is a goal that we all are striving for. We are continue, as I said, we continue to face strife. We continue to face struggle. And to be of one mind and one heart is a real, is a real challenge. But the enduring gospel message is one of hope for a holistic community life is where God's presence and compassion is assured. Those who confess Christ as Lord and live for the benefit of others continue to live out the good news and hear God's love, compassion, and hearing, healing. The path to living fully in God's reign in spite of challenges, struggles, pain, and suffering is found in a people being of one heart and mind with a humble servant nature of Christ. I remember, and I, I have a second quote that I would like to bring, and this one was from, uh, also from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and this quote caught my eye, or my ear. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, the most recent movie of Abraham Lincoln it dealt with a very short period of his reign. But it was during his inaugural, first inaugural address when he was uh, addressing, uh, addressing the crowd. The, the Civil War had not broken out, but at least there was the, the threat of it. I think some of the states had already declared secession, and, uh, but war had not been declared. And, 
And Lincoln was appealing. He was appealing for that unity, for that spirit of oneness. And uh, the term that he used, and one that struck a chord with me, was appealing to that better angels of our nature. That better angels of our nature. And he says, we are not en enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies, though passion may have strained it must not break the bonds of affection. The mystic chords of, of memory will swell again, touched as surely they will by the better angels of our nature. Heavenly Father, we pause to give thanks for our freedom to gather and worship. We give thanks for your presence in our midst. As we go into our daily lives, we ask for your guidance and direction that we may be more humble and understanding. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.